I am with Bryony and Ian aboard their new, brand new to them, Leopard 47. And um, they they did a lot of shopping and a lot of research and have a lot to tell us about what brought them to this boat. So if you guys could tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you came to be aboard your new boat. Absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we decided about two or three years ago that we wanted to live on a boat and travel around. Um, we come from Scotland, so we sold up everything that we had there and we moved out to the Caribbean. Um, we'd already kind of decided by that point uh, which model of boat we wanted. Um, we definitely shopped the wrong way around and decided <laughs> on the boat we wanted before having ever stepped foot on one, which is not advisable. <laughs> yeah, we, we had about two and a half years, maybe give or take, of researching online and trying to plan out just how do you make this ridiculous idea of reality. Um, so in that time, we managed to rule out a whole pile of boats we'd never seen or set foot on, and uh, we sort of started to fall in love with the boat that we eventually managed to buy. Yeah, so we uh, we uh, flew out to the Caribbean in August of 2020, um, and then we saw a few Leopard 47s um, on various islands, and we ended up buying this one in December. In USBI St. Thomas. Yeah. So why did you choose the Leopard 47 with no experience at all? How, what was it about that model that um, attracted you? Yeah, I know it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so it's spending way too much time online and reading far too many blogs and reviews is a good start to explain that. <laughs> um, actually, what it turned out was we were trying to get a balance. Um, an awful lot of the boats that we were looking at in the newer range, A, we couldn't really afford them. Uh, it's usually a good roadblock to anything like that. But uh, B, we were finding a lot of the newer, or certainly sort of post 2010 or 2008 boats, they were all being designed more as kind of um, houses on the water. You know, the, the comedy line is the condo, the floating condo. Uh, and we were looking for something that could take on some higher seas, go a little bit faster and a point better to win. But I actually have a bit more of a mono background and there was no way on earth you were being convinced. No, the first idea was let's go and live on a boat. And I said, no, I hate boats. Um, so we ruled out on holes quite quickly. Um, and then, yeah, we just kind of gradually narrowed it, the criteria down, um, starting off with it has to be a catamaran um, and then deciding what we wanted to do with it um, to, to narrow down each of the feature set until we found leopards and then we found the Leopard 47. That's uh, there are kind of battle hardened boats then we can talk about it later, but the Leopard 47 in charter fleets and things for years. So um, they have a bit of legacy about them, which is good and bad. Um, they're big, thick hulls. They're, they're really sturdy boats, uh, kind of before things started to get a bit more slimmed down and more cost effective. Um, so we like the idea of going for something a little bit older because we knew it, if it's had repairs, it's been hopefully done well. And if it has made it this far, hopefully it can make it a bit further with us at the helm. Yeah, it's been a boat that's been used in charter a lot. Um, so there's a lot of space for just two of us. Um, <laughs> But in choosing the 47, it's got 47 foot on the waterline, which just means it's that bit faster. So if there is bad weather, we can get out of it a little bit more quickly and it just makes it that much more safer as well. Yeah. So what would you say is the best thing about the Leopard 47? What were the, I know you talked about some of the specific overall attributes, but physically on your boat, what are the, some of the things you love? Yeah, there's quite a few things that we've kind of played with. So again, to do with the generation designs, the older leopards um, don't have the big open plan formats that a lot of the newer catamarans on the market have, where they can be almost cavernous. Um, so it's almost a bit more compartmentalized, but still big and spacious. So we're here in the saloon. I can easily see into the galley. I could call down into any of the cabins very easily. But the galley is a, a U-shaped galley. The saloon table here is a, a V-shaped saloon that we can sit within. So in higher seas, we can kind of work our way across the, the, the cabin space and you're never kind of rolling around waiting to fall into a wall. Part of that too is all the, the surfaces, um, all the corners are rounded. So if we are in big seas, you're not getting stabbed and poked in the sides, uh, which is a big bonus for us as well when we're out and about. Yeah, it is mainly to do with the layout and how we can use the space. Even outside in the cockpit, you've got a large table that you can have a lot of people sitting around, but you've got other seating on the other side and the helm, although raised, it's not separated. So a lot of the charter boats would have a space where you can sit at the helm and almost be in a completely separate space away from the guests and have that distance. Um, but actually with just two of us on board most of the time, we don't want it separated. That's not so safe and it's not so fun to be isolated like that. Um, and so a lot of it is just the use of space and how it suits us and what we want to do with it. 
That makes sense. Are there any things you've found since you moved aboard? I know you've only been aboard a month, but are there things that aren't quite what you wanted? <laughs> uh, definitely, there's so a few things we have noticed that it's an older boat. This boat was launched kind of before LED became a thing for a start. <laughs> so all the lights in this boat are filament bulbs or, or even fluorescent tubes in the, the heads. Um, so we're having to slowly kind of work our way through replacing every light fitting with LED just to save electricity. Uh, obviously, anyone who's been on the boat knows that everything is about power. Yeah. Um, and to that end, we're also currently renovating the, the power systems within the boat. So we have no solar panel on board. Uh, so we're running quite a lot of oh. in our generator. Uh, oh. Fingers crossed in the next few weeks or so, we're fixing that. We have quite a lot of solar <laughs> arriving at last. Um, yeah, some big projects coming up. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, we've got about 1400 watts of solar to try and squeeze onto your hardtop. Um, and then we're also converting to lithium as well. Um, being a charter boat, the batteries are old AGMs. They've certainly had a life and uh, maybe not the best looked after. So we're trying to kind of overhaul all those kind of electrical systems in the boat. Um, yeah, there's a few things that you can tell were designed for the charter market. Sure. And so now we're just having to modernize it a little bit or make it more suitable for cruising. Um, so as standard, it doesn't come from the factory with a hard top. Um, we spent some time on a Leopard 47, which only had a soft top, and it's just really impractical to work out how to work on the pole. Um, so we were very thankful when this one had it. Um, and also the Davit system, there's a lot of people have um, adapted them for whatever they think works. There's some really odd adaptations. Great but ideas. One of the things we really <laughs> like about the transom is that you've got this big wide open space um, and the view is nice and open so you can enjoy wherever you are. Um, but as soon as you lift your, di your dinghy onto the davits, it cuts off that space and you've got to crawl underneath and it just doesn't look as nice. So again, we're having to think about how we change that over um, and what suits us for, for making use of the space a little bit more. Absolutely, actually, and on that point about the boom that you mentioned, um, when we were on the soft top version, uh, so the Leopard 47 has a, a bimini over the cockpit by standard. Uh, we have a hard top now, but when it's a bimini format, um, you actually find yourself walking along the sail bag to zip up your sail bag, uh, oh. which is death-defying. It really is a very <laughs> yeah. scary experience, when, particularly when you're uh, in less flat water and you're having to hold on to the lazy jacks and work your way across. So if anyone's out there considering a Leopard 47 by the same sort of era, then yeah, the hard top is invaluable, if Absolutely. only for that safety standard. Yeah. You, you talked a little bit about this, the 2005 version, it was in, uh, designed to be a charter boat. Are, do you know of the 47s? Are there a variety of different models that people should be aware of? Or are they all kind of the same and vary from year to year? Um, they're pretty much the same within the 47 family. You do get an owner's version. So this version is the charter model, which is four cabins, four heads. Um, the owner's version, has one hull converted. Um, we were very tempted with that in the beginning, um, but it's about $100,000 more. <laughs> um, so that quickly put a stop to that plan. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that the 47 is really similar to the 45. Um, basically the whole internal layout is the same. The footprint is the same, but you just lose two feet on the back sugar scoops. Um, the, the table is a different shape and the galley rather than having a sort of squinty wall is, is straightened. But other than that, the space is the same. That's right. um, the internal volumes of the, the saloon galley area and the cockpit are identical. Um, so it's, it's really odd. It's as if they took the exact same design to cut the back sugar scoops <laughs> in half uh, and made steeper steps. Um, so it shortens your water line. Um, interestingly, in our research, we did find, and you know, there'll be 45 owners out there who will kill me for saying things like this. but. Uh, we did find that a lot of 45 owners adapt retrofit extended sugar scoops to try and push the back of the boat a little bit further out, make the, the longer water line. But also because in charter, it's absolutely fine. You've not got a lot of, you've got four suitcases or eight suitcases on board. In cruising, obviously, as many people will be aware, you start adding more living comforts to the boat. And that makes the back of the boat, the transom, a bit heavier. And on the 45s, reportedly, that pushes those sugar, sugar scoops, excuse me, uh, a little bit underwater underway um, and you know on the 47 we will drain the, the bottom step um, and that's before we started loading up the boat but uh, but yeah so 45 is definitely a lovely boat exactly the same volume inside you could renovate it all sorts of ways but having seen so many owners who have been fiberglassing extensions on the back of their boat we thought we'd just cut it short and jump straight to the 47. Yeah <laughs> 
then like having seen that the 45 was exactly the same we then knew of the 46 model and thought oh that must just be really similar as well and it's completely not it's totally different. Um, so yeah. that model came into being from 2008 onwards yeah. and it's completely changed the the layout is completely different the helm is raised and put above the table in the cockpit is a completely different shape um that boat has sail drives so the beds are lower you know everything about the boat is actually a, from a completely different uh, vantage point uh, design wise yeah. so and the only other thing to mention because you asked your question was um the, the leopard 47 goes by a few different names as well so it's the 47 and the for 4700 i think is the other one it goes by that was what it was called when it was in the moorings fleet um so if you see them when you're searching it's the same boat um right. they play, but they're ultimately exactly the same uh, i did come across somebody who labeled their boat a 47 xl and it turned out that was a 45 and they glued on some extensions and turned it into 47. Oh, that's funny <laughs> <laughs> it should be a 45 xl but yes so <laughs> So tell us about sailing the boat. What have you discovered so far? How does she do? What's her, I'll give you all the questions at once. What's the perfect cruising ground for her? Yeah, she is, she is a fast boat for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Obviously the longer water line, you're going to get a bit more speed, but we've, we average, I think between nine and 10 knots on almost every crossing we've done. Uh, and that's comfortable as well. Oh yeah. We can have conversations yeah. like casually across the cockpit okay. with that. Uh, and it's a very dry cockpit, actually, it should mm -hmm. be mentioned. Yeah. We've had a couple of waves in big, big, you know, big, big, for us, big seas, you know, three meter waves, that kind of thing, um, 12 foot seas. Then we might see the odd splash come in. Um, our top speed so far is. I think we've hit 15.7. 15.7 oh, knots. Um, nice. Which yeah. I think was, was not actually <laughs> crazy. We didn't realize we were going at that speed. We were just hanging out and chatting, and then, well, oh, look. Um, it was actually, oh, look, should we be reefing? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah generally under motor she'll cruise 1500 rpm she'll do seven yeah. six seven knots depending on currents obviously um so yeah she's she's a fast boat she's quite slender hulls so that's one of the big benefits of the and it's very low to the water as well so it does mean that uh, whenever we sail anywhere, there is a lot of hull slap. Um, the whole boat will kind of judder a little bit, which the first time I heard it, I was like, oh my goodness, the hull's falling off. Um, <laughs> the boat's falling apart, it's all over. Um, but that is normal, apparently. So it's Absolutely. just a little thing to get used to. It's a noise, but I mean, all catamarans get it, but the Leopard, the 47 in particular, is a lot lower to the water, which I like the look of. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you do get that as a payoff. Yeah. So Actually, in terms of that hull slap is for a lot of people a deal breaker so tell us about living with it and whether or not it is a deal breaker do you just adapt or is it really the big problem people seem to think it is that's a great question so yeah again in two and a half years of researching online we were dreading this terrible idea of the hull slap you know and it was oh well we'll get a boat that's 16 feet out of the water and avoid it um, <laughs> until you find a 17 foot wave and then you have the same problem so <laughs> <laughs> really, from my point of view anyway, it, it's nowhere near as big a deal breaker as I was expecting. Um, mm -hmm. There's definitely some getting used to. Um, for for example, in the cabins, if you're going to bed at night and you've got, we've had one or two times where we've had wind coming from one direction, but the swell from the stern. Uh, and the nature of the sugar scoops on the Leopard 47 is they actually curve slightly up, uh, almost like a, an oyster catcher. And um, so that swell can get underneath and cause a little bit of kind of gargling slap i suppose is the best descriptive word i can use mm -hmm. um which you'll hear from from the bed uh if you're in the stern cabins underway the slap is definitely juddering but it's not it's not uncomfortable it's not uncomfortable it. yeah exactly as soon as you expect it you just kind of tune it out yeah. um on our crossings we usually sleep up here this table drops and forms a day bed so we're not down in the hulls anyway um, it's not kind of conversation interrupting, it's very noticeable, but um, I certainly don't see it as a problem or, for me, not a reason to not get this boat, which yeah. I was nervous of before Absolutely. we came. It's actually quite a nice one. In some ways, I find it reassuring because it becomes a bit of an indicator, you know, in the same way that you're looking for telltales on a mainsail to let you know if you've got your sail trimmed right. It's If you hear that slap, it means there was quite a big wave just went by and maybe you should consider your, your sail plan slightly. Um, so it kind of, it's a little extra auditory cue in some ways, but it's not like we're doing this every three seconds, there's another big bang, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's every couple of minutes, every half hour, yeah. depending on the seas. 
Thank you. No, that's that's really interesting to know. Um, we lived on a catamaran and sailed around the world, but we had a higher bridge deck clearance, so didn't get the slap. But we did definitely get sounds against the hulls. We were in a fast, noisy boat, so it was. It, we learned to use earplugs in certain types of weather, and and just you adapt to what your boat does because you do. But um, lagoon four seventy. Uh, so a similar length of boat, similar age, but the lagoon release instead of a leopard. And it's a very similar thing, a much higher bridge deck. And so when we were down in the cabins, particularly underway, you hear that rushing hear water it. going past. <laughs> and it was almost like the slaps, instead of being underneath, were coming onto the sides of the, the internal sides of the hulls. Exactly. Yeah, that was sort of our experience as well. They would hit into the corner a little bit too. But so you you sound like you've been in a bit ahead of the weather. So how is she for reefing and all that sort of thing? Is it easy to handle shorthanded or single handed? Do you manage? Definitely two hander. Yes. Yeah. We're we're still getting there with kind of little tweaks and setups that we want to do um, with where the lines run to and things. At the moment, uh, we're all manual winches to lift the main. You have to go up to the mast and things like that. <laughs> great, Always yeah. great work out. I'm just going to say it now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So our reefing points are all at the the mast fit at the moment. So in order to reef, we have to go forward. Um, you know, in time and with some savings, maybe we'll re-rig the the boat and uh, put some running rigging back to the helm. Um, it's definitely, it's, it is manageable. We know people who single hand this boat all the time, mm -hmm. so it can be done. But in the bigger and heavier seas, probably less preferable simply because you're having to leave the helm on auto helm and that can be a bit uncomfortable for some people. Um, the other thing is, again, the way it's native rigging is, if you like, the, the running rigging is set up with a port and starboard winch. So in tacking, uh, your Genoa sheet is going to be, you're going to be running across the cockpit, basically. Right. Uh, which is wonderfully athletic, you know, it's great fun to, to leap between the benches. Yeah, <laughs> well, I was thinking you're young and fit, it, and it's fun to sail, as opposed to have yeah. everything sort of easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. There are, again, there's a couple of tricks we're learning on that front um, regarding running lines across the winches. Yeah, so we'll, we're sort of playing around at the moment with having the port side uh, jib sheet come back once around that winch, cross the front of the cockpit around that winch, and whoever's on helm can just let that out while the other person is hauling in the uh, the furler and things like that. So it's not the prettiest, but uh, we're working <laughs> out ways that make it work. Great That's thinking. fun. So um, she sails well in heavy weather. How have you done in light winds? All good there, or what are you learning? Yeah. Again, she's she's light. She's quite high out of the water, um, so she's, she's nimble. Mm -hmm. That's what I can phrase. Um, so yeah, in light winds, we'll probably what's the good example? We'll probably see. I mean, we haven't really sailed in light winds that know, much because we've been so consistent here in the Caribbean. <laughs> we're currently sitting in about 30, 35 knots at anchor. Um, so okay. It, in that kind of weather for us for the last wee while. Um, yeah. On the days where it's been particularly light, say less than knots of wind. We'll probably still be pulling around five knots, six knots at, at best, um, which I'm more than happy with in terms of our performance. Um, and you'll know being a catamaran, you've kind of got that playoff between using your main because it's nice and stable versus using your Genoa. Um, like many cats, the Leopard doesn't have a backstay of any sort. Um, your backstay is your topping lift and your, tra your traveler, pretty much. Right. Um, so we, we often will try and main, main split where we can rather than using the Genoa um, just because it makes me feel like we're doing something smart. I don't know if we are. <laughs> we're not sailors, you know. <laughs> so tell us about inside. How is it? How's the comfort? How's the headroom? How how does it work for the two of you? Start in the cabins. Yeah, so the headroom is generally very good. We are also both a little bit short. Um, <laughs> we're about five. Five eight, um, but we certainly aren't aware of any kind of headroom issues. the The biggest drawback for me about this model is the height of the beds. So, one of the biggest factors in uh, ruling out other catamarans was that we didn't want sail drives. We wanted something that was easier to maintain, and all we've heard about sail drives is problems. Um, and so that helped us to land on this model, but that means that the engines are under the beds and the beds are quite high. So in all four cabins, you're climbing up onto the beds, uh, which just reduces your headroom a little bit. It makes it feel slightly less of a home and slightly more like, oh, I'm doing something different or, you know, I'm staying somewhere unique kind of thing. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so it's cool, but for me, that was one of the best drawbacks. And I'm a guy, if I don't notice, I just fall asleep. <laughs> uh, That's uh, awesome. Yeah, no, I would say, like you say, the greatest uh, drawback is slightly less headroom in the, in the bed space, but the greatest benefit is that, that shaft drive based system. Um, for people who've been on monohulls versus other cats, um, probably to give an estimation, the headroom in the stern cabins, and it's not too dissimilar in the forwards, it's probably double a coffin berth of a monohull, um, you know, maybe three feet off the bed to the mm -hmm. roof. Yeah. And then lots of ventilation. That's another thing we really like about it. Um, we've got a, a, a port, sorry, a port light. We've got a hatch above every bed and at least one, if not two port lights in every cabin, another port light and hatch in the heads. Uh, we're the four cabin, four head version, as Brian said. Um, so yeah, that's certainly a big part of it for us is all that ventilation sort of helps that space. Yeah, and the heads themselves are, I think, slightly larger than we've seen on other catamarans. Yeah. So they're still very much, it's a head on a boat. Um, it's a wet room style, um, but you're not completely crammed in there. There's enough space in the cabin to move around. There's lots of storage in, in clever places. Um, so the Absolutely. hulls generally are quite well designed and thought out. Yeah. And there's an interesting tweak as well. So typical with lots of cats, you're trying to work out where things are. Uh, if anyone watching this is like me, they looked at maps, floor plans of these boats and frantically tried to work out where things actually lived. So in the 47, both the fuel tanks are actually midship, um, kind of where the top of the keels. Um, what that creates is actually a staircase effect. So you've got uh, from the, the saloon and galley area, you actually take one step down onto a, a gangway and then you've got three steps down stern or forward to take you into the cabins. So it kind of gives you that little extra level of isolation between the different cabin spaces. Um, yeah, it creates a little bit more privacy, I think. Yeah, and it's, it's surprisingly quiet and easy going. The, the stern cabins are obviously a bit noisier with the engines going. Um, mm -hmm. The generator in our boat, we happen to have one in the starboard aft. So um, it's a little bit behind the cabin, but you'll definitely hear it when it's going as well. Right. Uh, forward cabins we stayed in for a little while on, on another Leopard 47. And yeah, the ventilation is wonderful. You can open the top hatch and get air blasted all night. Um, <laughs> I should mention, being an older boat, um, all the cabins are, they're not island berths. Um, again, this is a deal way for some people I know. Um, we weren't so fussed about it, but you are having one person climb over the other person um, in terms of using the beds because they're, they're, well, they change orientation, but they're side on. Yeah, we had grand plans that whichever cabin we chose, we would rotate the bed so that we weren't having to climb over the other person. Um, but then we actually saw another Leopard 47 that had done that and thought, actually, you lose so much headroom um, that we thought, well, let's just keep it as it is and uh, keep the original design and we'll just work with that. <laughs> so the guy who designed this something right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So after all the research and being aboard for a bit, is it the right boat? Did, do you have boat envy for other boats or want to swap it or where are you at? Really interesting. A lot of people talk about how when they bought their boat, as soon as they stepped on board, they had this wonderful kind of halo <laughs> moment and they fell in love and they knew it was the right boat for them. And I thought, oh no, I didn't have that. Um, and yet I thought back to the first time we stepped on board at oh. Leopard 47 and it wasn't this one. And uh, everything that we had hoped for and, and all the reasons we had chosen oh. that model were all proven in, in the existence and our experience of it. And so I thought, actually, I've fallen in love with the model of the Leopard 47 and it wasn't this boat specifically, but I think all of the reasons that we wanted this boat, we've come on board, we've lived on it for, I mean, on various Leopard 47s for almost six months now. Um, and we're so happy with all of our choices. We've, oh, yeah. we've proven ourselves correct in what we were looking for, which is a relief. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, there's definitely some elements where we're, I would say in denial, but there's places where we're going, oh, well, I didn't expect that, mm -hmm. but I guess that's okay. Um, and we've mentioned some of those things, just realizing the height of the bed, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of at your shoulder level almost in terms of height and things like that. Um, so it's recognizing those things that we couldn't have ever told from a photo. Um, I think you're right. We definitely, we're very happy with the choice we've made and I'm very much looking forward to sailing here for quite a time. Of course, if you're asking me if I'm looking at any other boats, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard not to, right? They're all over the place. You want to kind of keep your eyes open. Um, I would say that a lot of the boats that people seem to run towards, I'm not so tempted by it. There's a lot of temptation for the boats that have fly bridges and everything else. Um, I've not quite gone that way. I do like the look of the New Balance, the 52. 
and obviously we could never afford it you know i'd have to sell all my lungs and kidneys and <laughs> it would never happen but uh it does look very beautiful and we spoke to somebody who uh, actually brought one over on a delivery um and they were saying they had intended to to surf across the equator behind the boat but the boat was too fast um so that tells me it must be pretty good um and yeah, that's kind of the only one I think on my radar. I'm not so interested in gunboats and things. If you want to sort of lust after boats you can't afford, that's the balance is probably the one that I'm most interested in. <laughs> <laughs> so to finish up, I guess, is there anything I didn't ask you? Is there anything you'd want people to know about the 47 that we didn't cover? Good question. Mm. Um, you know what? There's all sorts of things you're going to discover along the way should you get yourselves on board one. Um, mm. Generally speaking, the, the only other thing we didn't discuss is a recent bugbear for us, which I'm very happy to share because it, it helps <laughs> other people out. Uh, and that is one design flaw that we're convinced is a flaw. Um, it's to do with the life raft. Uh, so the life raft in the Leopard 47 is actually stored under a hatch in the cockpit. Um, it's right in the middle of the cockpit, a big floor panel that you lift open on hinges. Um, and some people may have heard of this or read about it, but it, the way it's accessed is either from above or if you're really adventurous and you manage to capsize the leopard, that'd be impressive. If you manage to capsize your boat, it also has a removable panel on the underside uh, held in by four wing nuts, basically, four bolts. Um, but due to that hull slap we were talking about and the amount of pressure going on under there, um, it seems to be quite a common problem and we've just been affected by it, whereby the bolts will actually shear. And um, so we arrived after our last crossing, uh, which was St. Thomas to St. Martin, and uh, we, we'd had some fairly rough weather on the way. And the next morning you were jumping in and you came out to let me know that we almost lost our life raft. It, was, it was just hanging at a very odd angle with all of the weight of the life raft pushing down. I don't know how the whole thing didn't just drop out. I mean, we wouldn't have known if it had just dropped out in the middle of the sea and, and you know, if suddenly you we come yeah. to use it <laughs> and uh, open up the hatch and it's just not there. So um, it's an odd design anyway, because we tried to lift it out and it, it's it was really hard work. Heavy. You must yeah. be relying on adrenaline to be able to do that. Certainly, only needed two people. Um, so a lot of people have either glassed that in um, so that it's not accessible from underneath um, and then moved the life raft to create storage on the transom or on the outside somewhere so that it's just easily accessible whichever way up your boat is. <laughs> yeah. right. So that's fixed yet, but we're uh, we're in exploration phase right now. So yeah. We'll keep okay. you posted. Okay, that's cool. 